yeah, just to let you guys know, I'm just, um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Nikki, who will talk about what Auckland Genomics can offer. And then at about 20 past uh, or 25 past, Yvonne will um, talk more about the 10X assays and sample prep um, and things to be aware of. Um, feel free to, to start, I think, Nikki. So I'm just going to start off by just giving a little introduction. So my name is Nikki Freed. I'm a lead technologist at Auckland Genomics. Um, I also do research there. I have Marsden funded research at the School of Biological Sciences. But 80% um, of my time is at, is at Auckland Genomics. So we are the core, one of the core genom genomic sequencing facilities at the University of Auckland. Of course now, there we go. Um, we are located right in, on campus, University of Auckland campus on the corner of Simmons Street and Wellesley Street in the Science Center here. So we have this beautiful lab space on the seventh floor of the building. Um, I'll give another little picture here. This is part of our lab space. We have, we like to consider ourselves as a university-wide um, platform. As I mentioned, we work with Grafton Clinical Genomics, who's another uh, genomics facility at the University of Auckland. We're actually in the process of um, making a collaborative platform with them. But generally speaking, we service many different people um, at the University of Auckland. So the majority of our University of Auckland users are from the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Medical and Health Science. But we have a huge number of users, almost 50% of our users are external. So other New Zealand universities, Crown Research Institutes, and some commercial institutes also use our facilities. So we like to sort of imagine that we are a national platform. Um, and really anyone who wants to use our facilities is welcome to. We are somewhat um, unique in that we charge a very small surcharge for external users. So other facilities can charge up to 30% or more for external users. We only charge about five or 6% surcharge. So it's actually a good deal. And I think that's why we have so many external users is the pricing is about the same wherever you are. This may change in the future, but right now that's how it is. Uh, yeah, so what do we do? You know, the, generally the majority of what we, what we do is high throughput or some people say next generation sequencing. Um, um, the majority of that sequencing is with Illumina sequencing. So we have three MySeqs in-house. We work with a wide range of partners. I saw Liam is on the call who I've taken over for. He's now running a NovaSeq down at Livestock Improvement Center. Um, we work with a range of different partners who have um, some of the larger Illumina devices. So we sort of <clears throat> can do, provide a whole range of data, um, data amounts um, with Illumina technology. We also do um, Oxford nanopore sequencing. So myself and Annabelle Wibley, who's um, also at University of Auckland, Auckland Genomics, um, we sort of consider ourselves to be um, experts, I, I want to say, on ex Oxford nanopore sequencing. We've done a lot of um, work with nanopore sequencing. So this is a long read single molecule sequencing. This is something that we're growing now at Auckland Genomics. We have a grid ion, multiple min ions that you can borrow if you want to use. If you want to do sequencing in the classroom or in the field, you can take these out uh, basically for free and use them. We have also sort of in the middle an MK1C. So we have um, lots of work with long read sequencing that we're starting to um, to grow. We, of course, do standard Sanger sequencing too. So if you just have a small piece of DNA that you want sequenced with high accuracy, we do that. Um, we try to do really fast turnaround times for our Sanger sequencing. Um, so we do two runs a week usually. Sometimes we can do, if you really need it quickly, next day services, um, if you have a bulk, a lot of samples. And it's um, a good price and <laughs> um, Christine, who runs this service, always says she gives free troubleshooting for anyone. So we, we do work with a lot of our clients very closely to make sure that they're getting the data that they want. We do a lot, actually, of microarray services. So these affymetrics arrays, this is something, too, that's growing as um, many facilities actually around the country and in Australia have stopped using microarrays. So there's actually a large number of people who are now using our facility, because we're still doing this, um, doing microarrays for gene expression and a range of different things with microarray. 
So that's another service that we offer. I think a really amazing thing about our lab is that we have a huge range of equipment that anyone can use. So it's all bookable on iLab, which is a, a booking system we have. Some of the equipment uh, you need a bit of training on, obviously, but some is free to use without training. Um, we have, and some of these that have, um, some do have a service charge. So for example, our digital droplet PCR, you can come in and use this, but it has a bit of a service charge. We have down here, 384 qPCR machine. We have uh, five or six Verity PCR machines, bioanalyzer, eight well nanodrop. We have qubit, we, have, we can do 96 well qubit reading um, with a plate reader that we have. We have now two liquid handling robots that um, people are welcome to come in and use free for charge, uh, apart from tips, you need to buy your own tips. Um, and also, as I mentioned, we have um, min-ion nanopore sequencers that you can take out to use to borrow for sequencing with your classroom or in the field. So I used to be a senior lecturer at Massey and we used to do this a lot with students in the class and they get really excited when they can do their own sequencing and see the um, sequencing in real time and stuff. So it's sort of a neat little technology and it's very inexpensive to use too. So it's um, a great little tool for classes. And, and also if you wanna do sequencing in Antarctica or in the field, that's a great, great tool that you can just borrow from us. So obviously I think a lot of people are here to learn about 10X uh, single cell sequencing. So that's obviously something that we also offer. We have the Chromium um, controller, and this is a machine that basically allows for single cells to be encapsulated. And Yvonne's gonna talk about this more in depth, so I won't even get into it too much, but you can encapsulate you know, a huge number of cells in a very short amount of time, and then barcode individual cells so that you can monitor the expression of each cell individually. Um, so that's something that we have in our lab. There are not very many of these. I think there's only one other one in the country. Um, and so this is something that we're trying to make sure that University of Auckland and other users know we have and uh, sort of highlight some of the capabilities that around the 10X. And that's why we're having this lunch and learn. Um, so you can multiplex. I think Ivana will also talk about this. You can multiplex. You can do different samples at once. Um, it's compatible with Illumina sequencing. R very, very recently, Nanopore has also come out with a protocol to do long read sequencing. I'm not sure if that's supported by 10X yet, but that's something that we're also sort of keen to try. I uh, haven't done that yet, but that's next maybe. We also work, we have a flow cytometry facility at the University of Auckland. And um, this is Anna Brooks, who we work closely with. So we often have users who have a population of cells but they're really only interested to do 10X barcoding on a subpopulation. So we work with Anna, their group will do cell sorting to get that population. And then they hand that to us, and go back, then we put it in the controller and barcode just that subpopulation. So that's a nice little collaboration we've got going where we can work with the flow cytometry people. They prep the sample, get that subpopulation of cells that you're interested in to barcode. So that's another nice, um, advantage, I guess, of, of working with us. Um, another project that we've been, well, projects that we're working on with Visium, so that's spatial transcriptomics. So we have a, actually a group this week and next week who are doing um, a Visium spatial 10x project with us. Um, and I think Yvonne again will talk more about this, but this is where you can take a tissue section, say of a tumor or of a a, a piece of tissue that you're interested in and put that, you use a microscope, visualize your tissue section and then basically barcode individual cells in a, in a 2D sort of dimension. And then basically you can do it um, and look at the, and analyze the expression and then map it back to the spatial location. I don't describe that as well as Yvonne probably does, but anyway, so that's something that we're also, doing now um, and we have pretty much everything in the lab to do that except for the microscope, but there are several different groups it, at the University of Auckland who have the imaging um, technology to do that. So we work with them. Okay, and obviously we have a great team. 
Um, we have Jayon Wu, um, Christine Boxen, Annabelle Wibley, and myself. So we're all working at the bench, definitely doing a lot of work with everyone to try to help design their projects, get the data that they want, um, troubleshoot, et cetera. Ant Poole is our academic lead. He helps with strategy and um, just gives us, he's a good advocate for us, I guess. Um, yeah, so basically, that's sort of us in a nutshell. That's Auckland Genomics. Um, I, we're usually people reach us through our email address or email addresses, um, but people often just stop by and not so much anymore, but definitely you can give us a call and um, stop by. Um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to give a little overview about what we do and what we offer. Um, and as I said, we're I'm really interested personally to make sure that there's more communication in the future between people who are interested in 10X to learn from each other. Um, we obviously have all the equipment to do the work, um, but there's a lot of other knowledge out there too that I hope that these type of lunch and learns we can sort of connect people, get some user groups going, things like that. So I think at this stage I'm gonna hand off to Yvonne. And if you have questions or anything, you can pop it in the chat and I'll look. I'm gonna to try to stop screen sharing, yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mickey. But um, it's great to actually see all the, you know, all the capabilities that you have uh, in in the new facility uh, in in your slide deck. I have uh, not included a lot of detail on spatial uh, on Visium, but I can I can talk a little bit about it. But please, anyone on the call um, today, uh, any questions? Please pass them on to us today or, or chat to us, we can certainly uh, touch on Visium as well um, in the presentation. Cool. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Well, lunch, it's lunchtime for you. I'm based in Melbourne. My name is Yvonne. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a science and technology advisor with 10X Genomics. And uh, with this series here that I think is a fantastic initiative, I would like to focus my talk today on you know, giving you a little bit more of an overview of the different types of essays that you can run on the 10X um, genomics platform on our Chromium controller, uh, just to, to set the scene for what you can do, what analytes you can, um, you can look at in um, a single essay. But the key focus really for today is to give you some tips and tricks on how to design your first experiment, what to look out for, um, you know, we, we, we touch on frequently asked questions that we get, typical ones, you know, how many cells, how many samples. Um, and I will focus a lot of my time actually on some of these sample uh, preparation considerations, because that really is um, the key with, with any single cell or, or also spatial uh, gene expression experiment, your cell suspension or nuclear suspension. Um, is um, is the key um, to, to obtain that at, at highest possible quality. I'll talk a little bit about grant writing uh, resources that we have because we also know this is uh, the second biggest struggle, you know, to obtain enough funding to conduct these experiments and then uh, yeah, leave enough time uh, for, for your questions at the end. So, um, as Nikki already introduced this beautifully, I don't really need to, need to say too much more. Um, we have a two platforms in the market at the moment. So our Chromium single cell platforms, uh, one of them being the Chromium controller that you see here. It was actually really nice to see that size comparison in Nikki's image uh, of all the um, instruments she has in the lab. So that the Chromium uh, controller is actually really quite small. Um, compared to, you know, sitting next to the, the quant studio, for example. So we always compare it a bit to the size of a shoebox. And then we have our Visium uh, spatial gene expression solution, which really just um, is conducted on a, on a glass slide, on a specialized glass slide. Uh, we have optimized this for Visium uh, for fresh frozen as well as FFPE tissues. So that's been uh, compatible with FFPE for, um, more than um, eight or 10 months now. Um, and there's a lot of publications now coming out uh, on um, FFPE tissues. And uh, you know, it is enabling you to do the whole transcriptome profiling 
of um, intact tissue sections on a 6.5 millimeter by 6.5 millimeter uh, capture area. And you have four on a Visium slide. So the image that you see here is one of our tissue optimization slides that has a few more on them. Um, but you are looking at, spatial, uh, at gene expression in spatial context. And then the next platform that is going to be coming very soon is our in situ platform, which is an individual box. Um, you know, you don't need any extra sequencing equipment to this. And this really is going to enable um, uh, single cell level uh, gene expression and protein analysis. <clears throat> But that's coming early next year uh, to us. So at the moment, uh, we have these, these two platforms. And on the left here, again, coming back to single cell, you can run uh, one uh, of these four assays on the instrument. So you can do single cell gene expression profiling, capturing the transcript uh, from the three prime end. You can do immune profiling, uh, and you can also do um, a tag seek, which is one of our epigenetic um, products where you look at uh, the assay to look at transposers accessible chromatin. So looking at uh, accessible chromatin, uh, we have the product that combines gene expression with this attack seek assay. So you can uh, measure transcriptome as well as uh, open uh, chromatin at the same time. Um, what we really try to do at 10X is to not only provide or generate these products or develop these products, but also have the, um, the analysis tools um, associated with this available. They are free, so Cell Ranger and Space Ranger uh, analysis tools um, to analyze your data. And then the Loop Browser tool actually runs on your laptop. For those of you who may have already done or looked at data from our uh, publicly available um, data sets, Loop Browser you can download for free as well, runs on your laptop and you can really interact with these data sets. Um, and on the left here, we actually see one of those spatial uh, gene expression data sets where you see the image and you get um, to, uh, you get to look at your uh, gene expression at the same time. We have launched cloud-based analysis. Unfortunately, this is still only available in the US. Um, and I will you know, let the team in New Zealand know uh, when that is coming to our part of the world, um, as this will also you know, make analysis a bit more accessible and a bit easier if you do not have any bioinformatics um, you know, capabilities. So this year, I just want to put it out there because I find this personally really exciting. When I joined a year ago, you know, we were sitting at 2,000 publications, so just under 2,500. So that's in a year's time, we now have, you know, 1,000 publications more um, on single cell and, and spatial gene expression. So it's really exciting what's being done with the technology um, and for you also, you know, to, to draw on some of these experiences that, that uh, these groups uh, publish on in every um, thinkable research space. And this is also including egg bio. So there is plant and animal single cell data available as well. So there is a few new things coming and I'm not going to really go much into detail of those, but specifically for the single cell uh, platform for the Chromium platform, we are making some improvements to the attack seek assay. Uh, there's going to be a version two coming out with an optimized enzyme, which we actually already have in the multi kit. So we're just adjusting that attack seek assay uh, for CRISPR screening. We will have this coming out now for five prime as well. But two things that I am going to talk about today is our single cell fixed RNA profiling kit. Uh, because fixing cells um, and keeping them stable to transport them to anywhere you need to, to get your sample sequenced, you know, for example, in, in Auckland is going to be really uh, quite helpful. And we also are coming out with a nuclei uh, isolation kit, um, you know, package uh, product that is going to be more robust than uh, nuclei isolation methods that, that have previously been used. There's also a few additional uh, products coming out for in the Visium spatial um, product range. We are combining protein expression 
with our spatial gene uh, expression profiling a platform launching um, a new oncology panel uh, first. And then of course our high throughput or high definition um, Visium is coming out with a single cell resolution um, at the end of the year as well. And then instrument automating the placing of a section from a simple glass slide into this instrument um, and the instrument takes care of basically sandwiching that with the Visium slide and transferring the RNA uh, transcripts onto the slide to be captured. So that, sort of that whole upfront uh, tissue sectioning, placing of tissue sections on a slide uh, is going to be automated on that instrument. So if we're looking now at the um, single cell um, platform, uh, this is not just for organoid data, um, you know, it's for any single cell um, experiment, really. Uh, the four different assays that I mentioned that you can load onto the microfluidic micro chips uh, that you see here at the top, if you can see my, my curse, my mouse. Um, with the Chromium controller, you can run up to eight samples uh, in one go. You can capture up to 10,000 cells per lane. Um, so 80,000 in total. If you are using the multiplexing option with our cellplex kit, which is only enabled at the moment on our uh, single cell uh, three prime gene expression solution, you can um, double the capture, almost double it. So you can capture uh, 17,500 single cells per lane uh, using our multiplex product. Those really are um, recommended for experienced user. And that is the advantage you have by running it through Auckland Genomics with Nikki because the team there is highly experienced and can maximize you know, the throughput um, enablement as well as you know, running um, also up to eight samples um, on a chip. And just highlighting here again on the, on the workflow side of things that really the key is the cell or nuclei suspension. So chromium, um, the chromium controller um, is capable of uh, running both um, input types. And uh, once this, the libraries are made, this is typically a one or two day workflow. Uh, they can be sequenced on a Illumina uh, ready sequencer. And then you do get the files that can be read in either the cell ranger or then the C loop file, which is generated by cell ranger, uh, can be loaded into the loop browser to analyze your data. Now to Give you a quick overview um, of what you can capture with each assay. So, of course, it is um, transcriptome wide, uh, wide gene expression. So, with each individual uh, droplet that we are capturing, um, so each individual cell that we are capturing in, in a droplet, you can measure um, every single transcript. So, these the technology that we have uses. Um, oligo coated beads and uh, one of the parts of the oligo is a poly DT tail. So we're capturing all polyadenylated uh, RNA molecules. Uh, so there is, you know, some slight limitations there. So if you are looking at a bacterial gene expression, for example, there's a few challenges um, with that to start with to actually crack open the bacterial wall, but basically um, because we are detecting polyadenylated RNA, you, you most likely won't capture uh, bacterial RNA. Um, three prime gene expression allows, however, you know, additional analytes uh, to be looked at at the same time uh, from every single cell, and that is cell surface proteins. So you can go, you know, beyond a hundred cell surface proteins if your budget allows. So from the technology side of things, there's really no limitation, um, but you are using antibodies uh, detecting uh, the cell surface proteins of interest. And these antibodies are tagged with a specific oligo, as you can see here a little bit in the graphic. And these oligos are uh, being detected with our a technology with the three prime gene expression uh, gel beads. And this is so we, uh, how we capture 
the cell surface protein information. Uh, this product or how you can run this is usually uh, the total seek B product range from BioLegend. These are compatible with 10X, so they have this uh, oligo tag on uh, the antibodies. You can buy them um, as pools. So they, for, for example, have um, a discovery antibody pool uh, where you can screen, you know, a large number of antibodies at the at the same time. Uh, and the beautiful thing about the BioLegion products is that they are already pre-titrated. We still recommend you uh, performing a fine-tuned titration for optimal results and low background, uh, but you know the majority of the work is already done uh, by, Bell, by uh, BioLegend. And another uh, type of analyte that you can put on top and a readout that you can get at the same time as your transcriptome and cell surface protein is um, you, you, would be, you are um, able to look at CRISPR perturbations. So you can do CRISPR perturbation screening uh, where we uh, detect these specific single guide RNAs uh, and that is enabled due to a specific design process. So you do need to include uh, capture sequence one or two into the guide RNA design, either in the stem or in the loop. Uh, and that's how we detect them or capture them from, from the cell. But you can at the same time read the gene expression uh, changes that that single guide, that expressed single guide in the cell um, um, resulted in. So these three readouts at the same time um, are possible. And this is in the lab, you would generate uh, different library types different libraries from your individual, from your starting um, material that comes off the chromium controller and you sequence those all um, individually, uh, but then can read them and look at them together in the analysis software. Moving on to the immune profiling kit, the five prime kit, as, it's, as the name suggests, here we are looking at transcriptome wide gene expression. Uh, capturing that from the five prime end of the transcript. So, you know, digital five prime gene expression. We, um, with the current version that's in the market, it is really comparable uh, in terms of what it compared to the three prime gene expression transcriptome analysis that we, that we can do. So both products really don't show any differences anymore in the transcriptome uh, uh, capturing capability. Uh, but the uh, five prime immune profiling kit allows you to obtain full length paired BDJ sequences from T cell and B cell uh, receptors. So that's uh, unique to this kit because we are looking at the five prime end. Um, we can really expand the menu of analytes out to, um, to, uh, to enable the, the BDJ full length um, sequence um, information. And it works in the way that you uh, that you perform a PCR enrichment step from the whole transcriptome MNR molecules that were captured from single cells to pull out these uh, specific uh, VDJ um, sequences. And on top of this, cell surface protein analysis is also enabled. So same principle really, a uh, different product range from BioLegend. It's the total CC uh, antibodies that, that are compatible with the five prime immune profiling solution. So if you do decide to do this, you know, just um, ensure you, you are getting the, the compatible product. And uh, we can also enable antigen recognition of T cell uh, and B cell receptors. So you are basically able to um, uh, run uh, labeled antigens, antigen mixes in your uh, in your experiment, load it onto the chromium controller, and again make a separate library in the in the library generation process, and capture that information as well and map it back. And lastly, uh, our epigenetic product range, uh, the the attack seek assay on its own, the assay for transposers accessible chromatin. Here we are using nuclei only. And um, you know, uh, using the transposase enzyme to perform um, the the capturing of these accessible chromatin pro um, chromatin um, pieces, basically, and, and run them through the chromium controller. That allows you to get a deeper understanding of cell states and uncover gene 
regulatory programs by allowing you to drive these, uh, you know, uh, differentiated and not just in organoid cultures, but in general uh, differentiation in cells. And you can monitor these changes in the chromatin accessibility over time with the changes of your uh, growing conditions, for example, or, or drug treatments in, in your experiments. And it is made a bit easier to map this to the transcriptome changes with the multi ion kit, uh, where we capture both uh, whole transcriptome uh, gene expression 3 prime as well as the, um, the accessible chromatin uh, fragments. <clears throat> Again, for this essay, you use uh, nuclei as an input material. So this is the, uh, the first part, just as an introduction to what you can do uh, with the uh, 10X essays. And now uh, I wanna move into the part of talking about some of the considerations that we find is our key uh, to know and think about uh, when you design your first experiment. Um, and there are several different parts to consider uh, that are different to a bug RNA a sequencing essay, for example, that, that we are all very familiar with. And uh, one of the things that you know we've already mentioned is that obviously your sample quality is key. And what that means is you the cell, um, the sample itself needs to be clean, so free of debris. Um, for example, you know, containing the cells of interest. Uh, so as Nikki said, uh, the fact that you can actually work with the uh, fact sorting uh, facility uh, to obtain, you know, a certain subset of cells that you're interested in, and that's fantastic um, to have that capability and that process of sorting also uh, cleans up your sample. Um, but another really critical uh, thing to consider is that the cells need to be highly viable. So for the majority of assays, we, we say 70% cell viability or higher, but really you wanna be higher than that. We, we do say, you know, 90% cell viability or higher um, is uh, desired. And all the while, you know, processing cells, you wanna minimize the cell stress and keep that expression profile as um, physiological as possible from the time of collection. Um, so some of these things, you know, will require careful logistics, uh, careful planning, where's your sample collected, where would you then prepare your sample, where would you do your uh, library preparation, sequencing, and data analysis, and how will you get it from, uh, you know, from A to B, uh, and that's, yeah, a plan for that is crucial, so Nikki can help with this, but uh, 10X also has some resources to support this kind of logistics uh, planning as well. And then obviously crucial, the experimental design where you know from all the analytes um, that you uh, can do from what I just told you about, but what are you interested in? You know, what do you want to capture? Um, really picking the right assay and then picking the number, the right number of cells and samples to, uh, to obtain that information and make it statistically uh, significant or, or uh, meaningful in, in terms of analyzing, uh, answering your question. And sometimes your experimental design is actually limited by the type of sample that you have access to. So if you really know you only have FFPE tissue to work with, that really limits the essay that you can run. So know your research goals, um, be aware of the logistics and the steps uh, that, that are involved in sample prep, the preservation methods that you might have to choose and whether you uh, want to isolate single cells or nuclei, uh, enrich or deplete your cells and then uh, perform QC steps. All those parts are really crucial in a single cell workflow. And as I mentioned, you know, we do have um, a large number of demonstrator protocols available. Uh, for a lot of commonly used tissue types um, that, that can help you. So please always feel free to contact us um, or Nikki, the facility to provide them to you uh, or you know, reach out to discuss a specific um, um, sample type that you wanna use or a different um, um, problem that you're facing in, in prepping.
so the QC step also is something I want to mention that is quite crucial to conduct those. Uh, there are several for the different types of samples that you use and accurate cell counting is also um, important, uh, allowing you, you know, to maximize the number of cells that you, that you are capturing per lane, uh, which is the 10,000 that we mentioned, or up to 17 and a half thousand singlets when you multiplex. Um, so knowing the exact cell number is, is absolutely important. So here, um, this slide, I think, actually summarizes quite nicely what assay type or what research goal really requires, what input material. Uh, so if you're looking at the sample uh, considerations, depending on what you're measuring and what you're interested in, you know, you can, uh, for example, only work with whole cells if you want to uh, look at protein expression and RNA at the same time. Uh, if you are looking at RNA, so gene expression only, you have sort of the biggest flexibility. You can do this from whole cell input as well as nuclei. So there is, you know, flexibility there. There's an overlap. If you are looking at RNA expression and open chromatin, um, the chromatin accessibility, you, um, you, you are require to use nuclei as an input there. So that is um, crucial. That's the only compatible input for the uh, for our chromatin accessibility kits. Uh, so again, you know, look at exactly what you are after and, and pick the right um, cell input. So what really means a good quality sample, you know, or critical, uh, uh, critical uh, quality, sample quality. And uh, what we mean by that is they need to be intact. Now, I know that's, that is all very um, common knowledge. Um, you need to have an intact cell with intact cell membranes where the nucleic acids is maintained inside the cell. Um, what that does is it gives you very little background signal uh, and really clean signal cell data. So, you know, we are not saying that every single cell needs to be like that. So we will always acknowledge there is cells in within the sample that may be uh, compromised, uh, but the, uh, you know, the cleaner your sample is, the more intact the whole cell population is, the better your single cell data will be. And a compromised cell with compromised cell membranes uh, where the RNA can start to leak out really what we see with those kinds of data sets, we see a very high or increased background signal, uh, which unfortunately means, you know, poor signal cell data, because you simply can't tell anymore uh, which cell that transcript that was captured actually is derived from. So you're getting, you know, um, um, sort of unfocused in, um, uh, data uh, in, in your, from your experiment. So really, creating these intact cell suspensions. And what that means is, so what we are looking at there is these, uh, these three key factors. It needs to be clean, the cells need to be healthy, and they need to be intact. So the goal really is when you are doing um, sample preparation is to minimize cell aggregates and clumps. So this is um, you know, observed under microscope or um, in, in a cell counter, you can see this. You do want to minimize subcellular debris and, free, um, and therefore also enough free floating RNA DNA. So the example here is a very nice example of a clean um, signal cell suspension. You do want to have healthy cells. So you want to minimize any biological decomposition, any RNA leakage. Um, and RNA degradation. So really you wanna be working fast um, in, in the right, correct environments, either uh, on ice, uh, cold, or you are using the um, tissue uh, storage solutions, for example, before you're transporting a collected tissue or, or cryopreserve your, your cells as soon as you can. Here, um, I have, you know, the cell viability target of greater than 70%, but really I want to highlight and stress it should really be higher than 70%, ideally at, at 90%.
There is some differences between, um, you know, cells versus nuclei. Uh, we've covered those already, uh, you know, what assay you can run, what pro protocols are available. Uh, so I just leave this here for you to quickly uh, run uh, through this. Um, I guess probably the, the one that I want to uh, highlight here is that with cells you can uh, you can obtain and look at a spliced mRNA and nuclei. Um, it's usually just uh, unspliced RNAs with lots of introns that you capture. So it's just one of those things to be aware of when, uh, when choosing nuclei, but also that you are not able to look at cell surface proteins because simply you don't have the membrane retained at the, at the end of the sample prep. So nuclei, um, ex uh, extracting nuclei for specific assays is um, important uh, to look at specific uh, quality control measures there. And they are, they are different uh, to looking at a cell suspension quality control. Uh, one of the steps that you conduct in the, um, in the sample prep uh, workflow is you're doing a lysis a time course basically. And uh, what you'll need to do is you need to assess the efficiency of that cell lysis. Um, and what you want to have is uh, the image in the top here, for example, you want uh, very few live cells remaining and you want to have, um, uh, you know, you want to have nuclei stained as dead. You don't want clean, uh, you want clean clump free nuclear suspension. So you don't want to see a lot of clumps floating around. Uh, so an image like that in the top there would, opt, uh, would indicate an optimal cell lysis was conducted. At the, the image at the bottom is you know, suboptimal. So here we still have a lot of live cells left and uh, also ob observing some cell clumps and debris. So that would need to be optimized. So the lysis time slightly increased. And then also you know, sample cleanup needs, needs to be conducted to improve the um, quality of that nuclei suspension. The second type of uh, quality assessment that we would do um, or that we recommend, highly recommend, is assessing the membrane quality um, under a 60-fold magnification bright field uh, microscope. Um, and what you want to see is uh, an image similar to A and B, so very smooth uh, cell membranes with little or no uh, sort of blebbing. And if you see anything like C and D, uh, you know, the cell prep method is not optimized um, and needs then needs further um, optimization. We often get the question, you know, even after careful um, isolation um, and prepping, removing uh, dead cells, um, et cetera, and cleaning up uh, the cell suspension or nuclear sus suspension still doesn't meet the criteria to uh, to be used in a single cell run on the commune controller, but there is a few uh, different steps that you could undertake. So sometimes a simple wash step uh, will remove most of the debris, uh, a filtering step, uh, you know, running it through a specific filter that we highly recommend so that you do not destroy the, the cell integrity uh, can sometimes work, or you can conduct certain enrichment or depletion um, methods to enrich your sample and increase um, you know the QC um, of your sample type. So I, I appreciate this is really again high level as such that it's not specific to a sample type, but you know I just wanted to give you the, the overview that there is ways of then improving the quality uh, of your of your sample before using it in a, a single cell experiment. So one quick um, a few slides on a, a new product that we are going to be releasing mid-year, which is um, a, a kit supporting uh, nuclear isolation uh, from fresh frozen tissue. So uh, this, this kit really will be um, enabling streamlined sample prep. Uh, so you need a, a, only about an hour of lab time uh, to extract uh, high quality nuclei with this product. And there's just some sort of high level data basically showcasing you that we can increase um, the fraction of reads that we've detecting in cell utilizing this chromium nuclear isolation kit over a humble uh, nuclei isolation protocol. This is shown here on adult mouse kidney samples. 
So there is a few more um, data sets uh, closer to launch or release in our whole uh, tech note uh, on the performance of this kit. But really, I wanted to mention this here today that there is a new kit going to come out to really make that um, nuclear isolation um, process a lot more simple. The only caveat is that this product uh, is only going to be um, compatible with the Chromium X uh, higher throughput instrument. It doesn't actually run on the Chromium controller, um, but I, I just wanted everyone to be aware this is available in case you are uh, running into trouble with the nuclear isolation methods that, that uh, are out there and that are validated with the 10X workflow and in most cases work uh, that there is a new uh, new product coming um, that increases specific you know nk cell monocyte and t cell populations for example in the tissue uh, in the extraction over um, standard nuclear extraction methods again this is coming uh, mid next year uh, mix, mid excuse me mid next year uh, this year um, so just briefly, again, looking at the at the workflow and the different, you know, different stages, but focusing back on the collection and transport uh, problem that you sometimes face when you collect samples. And uh, for most people, if you do work with blood, it is relatively simple uh, to collect and, and minimally invasive and it contains uh, critical information about our immune system and our overall health. Uh, but even you know with this uh, with this sample type and with this collection type, because there are so different, so many different blood collection tubes, we often get the question, you know, what temperature should the bl blood be transported at? How long can we wait between collection and processing? And uh, which anticoagulants and isolation methods are compatible with our single cell chemistry. So all those different things uh, will need to be considered. Uh, I just wanted to show first that we have um, protocols available to extract uh, cells, um, cryopreserve them, and then extract them from a cryopreserved sample. In this case, here shown on PBMCs. There is a very high correlation between fresh and cryopreserved cells observed. So this is really reassuring in terms of retaining um, the quality of the cells um, and the um, uh, and the data that you obtain. On the right here, some of these um, in, uh, documents, the protocols and the uh, the application notes uh, can be found on the support side. But please reach out if uh, you would like to know more uh, about those. <clears throat> so uh, really when working with blood uh, samples, uh, there is some key consideration during collection and amongst the four most commonly used um, anticoagulants uh, that, that, that are out there, there is really no difference observed in PBMC representation in the single cell gene expression data. So that basically means that most of these collection tubes are uh, compatible with the 10 uh, platform. And once the blood is collected, the next question is usually what temperature should I ship um, and, and store my sample at before it can be processed. And um, so when we look at here in the middle, um, middle graph of the, uh, of the slide, we see that the, um, uh, the overlay of the gray and blues here show that the storage at four degree out to 48 hours preserves the same uh, PBMC clustering as we have observed immediately after collection. Uh, while storing at room temperature shown here in orange and red uh, led to stress-related shifts in immune cell clusters, suggesting that the four degrees Celsius storage should be employed for blood um, wherever possible. And you know, keeping the uh, storage time to uh, 48 hours, ideally um, at, at most. And then here, lastly, on the right, we compare different um, isolation methods um, with uh, standard PMC, PBMC isolation, and we see almost a near perfect correlation in global gene expression uh, between isolation methods of freezing uh, versus, you know, what, what's out there for customers. So really, 
um, using these tubes, storing them at four degrees uh, for up to 48 hours um, is a really convenient way of working with blood. Um, there is something that we would like to point out um, as someone who is interested in looking at neutrophils, you know, typically we find they are difficult to uh, preserve or di difficult to extract, uh, but using, you know, some of these uh, blood tubes, we do actually see that you can enrich neutrophils and other granular sites um, for up by up to, um, and up to, uh, in this example here, up to 80% of these are actually covered and recovered in the, in the sample. So we have this graph available uh, for you, which is sort of a bit of a decision tree. If you do work with blood, uh, kind of highlighting what, what I just went through uh, to really pick the most ideal um, collection method and, and storage temperatures and times uh, for your experiment. So uh, that, that should help picking the right um, the right method. Now, if you're working with tissue and the tissue obviously needs to be collected in most cases transported, there is also uh, a similar flow chart that we've developed uh, to really enable uh, or, or showcase you when you should use these different collection methods, um, how to transport them. But then most importantly, you need to consider what type of um, uh, sample you can prepare. So for example, if you just snap freeze a tissue section, uh, the, um, you will only uh, be able to extract nuclei from that. Uh, but if you are able to uh, process or collect your tissue sample and either store it in tissue storage solution or uh, undergo a specific tissue cryopreservation protocol, uh, you then can also extract cells uh, from these tissues. So really crucial to look at and, and also, you know, decide how long you need to be able to store your tissue uh, to pick the right um, method for your tissue uh, collection. We also have uh, specific uh, recommendations if you're working with uh, organoids, for example, uh, just at high level here, uh, you know, we, we go into a lot of detail on different organoid types, uh, different cell densities that is usually observed, and then the dissociation um, methods with the references. So if you do find yourself working with a sample that you can't use, uh, that we don't have a specific protocol for, most likely we can definitely advise you on how to, how to process the sample. So I might skip the fixed RNA profiling um, uh, product uh, just in the interest of time. We are nearing uh, one o'clock to, to leave enough time for, for questions. Um, so just skipping through the, the fixed RNA uh, kit that is, that's going to come out um, and just wanted to address a couple more things that we often get asked, which is the sequencing considerations. Uh, you know, once you've got your sample prep sorted, a lot of people wonder, you know, what should I, how, how deep should I sequence what's required? So the first piece of advice here is we do have, uh, we have validated our uh, kits on a variety of sequences. Um, and every single kit that we have actually has sequencing recommendations um, that, we, that we actually post in the in the user guide. So in a majority of cases, it is 25,000 read pairs per captured cell. Use this as a starting point, but uh, obviously we, we do know that different sample types have different sample complexity. And as uh, that complexity changes, you know, your uh, sequencing requirements will change. Um, so it's just one thing that you need to remember there that uh, more sequencing, increasing the sequencing uh, throughput doesn't obviously necessarily mean you're capturing more genes, but you will uh, be able to uh, capture rarer transcripts uh, that you might be interested in picking up in your sample. However, you are also going to start seeing more uh, duplicate reads in your sample. 
And if you, you know, don't capture or don't sequence enough, if you go uh, below the recommendations for our essay, you, you could potentially, you know, wondering whether you're not capturing enough data. So you really want to be in that sweet spot where you get enough reads and capturing the, major the, ma the majority um, of genes. So something that we recommend, you can run a small pilot project, for example, uh, where you just run a couple of samples and sequence it at a specific depth and look at, um, you know, the transcripts that you're getting if you're capturing these rare transcripts and then can always increase the sequencing uh, depth later on in, in your subsequent experiments. Might skip over the cell data analysis slide and just address um, the next common question that we get, which is how many cells uh, should I run? And again, there is not an easy answer, um, you know, 5,000 if you want to do this, 10,000 if you want to do that. But as a rule of thumb, if you are just looking at characterizing uh, subpopulations of cells within your sample, you know, you can uh, get away with a few thousand cells in your sample. So one to 2,000 cells tend to be enough. You can, you know, if you're profiling um, organs or tissues, if you want to identify novel genes, uh, you want to increase this, um, the cell number um, that you're running, you know, up to 5,000 is something what we typically see in those cases. But if you're moving into uh, lineage tracing and a rare cell type uh, discovery, uh, you need to increase the number of cells. Usually, you know, we recommend to go uh, to the highest recommended or highest possible a cell capture of, of 10,000 per sample. So really, you know, look at what you are uh, wanting to capture and then pick um, the number of cells accordingly. There is a great tool out there that's been developed by the Satya Lab, um, which is an interactive tool that considers, you know, the number uh, of uh, or the targets that you want to look at, the sample diversity, uh, desired number of cells that you want to see in a cluster, for example, and then uh, it calculates for you in the background, you know, how many cells would be ideal uh, to utilize in your example. So we do find this is quite a useful tool to use um, if you don't, if you know context of your sample composition and research goal already, uh, this definitely helps to identify the ideal number of cells. Uh, some, sometimes the number of cells that you can run um, is defined by the sample type and the size that you, that you may obtain. So if you only are obtaining a very small human biopsy uh, tissue, then there is obviously a restricted number of cells that you can get out of, of these specific samples. So in that case, then you need to carefully consider uh, your downstream um, uh, analysis or whether you do want to fax sort or if you if you do want to multiplex because in those cases with very few cells that's not possible. And then lastly how many samples uh, this is really something that we get asked a lot and we always say it depends on your question uh, but as a rule of thumb these two things that, that we are showing here on the slide tends to work as a as a good starting point if you are working with a cell line uh, as a homogeneous population with a specific treatment, then you can consider each cell as a replicate. So here you really just need um, your one plate, one population derived in your cell, um, in your cell culture experiment. But if you're working with a heterogeneous sample with a specific treatment, so, you know, uh, tissue sections, tissue derived um, samples, uh, you're expecting a lot more variability that you need to account for. And the more, the more variance you expect, the more replicates you, so you need to run. So if you, if you can talk to a bioinformatician, they will also have their input. But in these cases, we definitely uh, typically recommend uh, to consider a replicate of three um, samples. And just wrapping up with, uh, you know, some of these different protocols that we have available, uh, the demonstrated protocols and the compatible with the compatible products, uh, like the Milteni automated dissociator that's being used in, in, uh, on a regular basis. But we also have a number of customer developed protocols available on our website. So if you do need, um, you know, 
support um, or us pointing you in the right direction, please get in touch or, you know, we can talk you through uh, these protocols in, in a in a one on one discussion as well, or in conjunction with with Nikki. Um, so I'll just leave that there. Uh, now I'm I've run slightly over. It's five past one, but I'll leave this up for um, for discussion now, and uh, we'll see that we can answer uh, some of the questions that may have come up. None yet. I can't see any in the chat. No. Uh, thanks so much, Yvonne and Nikki. Um, uh, yeah, please put any questions in the chat and also uh, Karen, if, um, feel free to just let everyone available to speak. I think that's an option, um, allow to talk if that's, yeah, if people prefer yeah. that. Um, we have some grant writing results as well. While you might think of a question uh, to answer for your specific uh, sample type or experiment that you might be planning. There is actually some resources out there, um, you know, that have summarized the, the technology and how to sort of put it in the grant um, for, you know, just a copy paste kind of a, a approach. So uh, if you need that, if that's uh, of use, please uh, reach out. Uh, and this is again, a, a sort of an overview of some of the different guides that we have. Some of the things we've discussed today, getting started, um, is is put in the getting started guide, uh, getting started with single cell gene expression guide, as well. But we also have more deep dive tech notes and sample prep protocols um, available. Everyone's quiet so far. Is there? I'm just leading into what Nikki said before. Like, what um, you know, what do you researchers want to do? What do you want help with? Is there anything more you want to see? Um, we have been having quite a lot of discussions. Um, yeah, with Yvonne and I, or Yvonne and I and Nikki, that's possible if you want to um, kind of have a more private conversation about um, your particular experiment. Um, we do them very frequently, often just, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to discuss it, can really narrow it down, then you know exactly what reagents you need from Nikki, um, yeah, what you need from the team, so. What works quite well in with customers in Australia, with, uh, you know, service providers, we, we do have these um, upfront sort of experimental planning discussions uh, with individual researchers. So Nikki, we can we can consider whether we wanted to run those together. Uh, you know, we, we sit down with the researcher. So you reach out to Nikki um, and then we have a really detailed discussion around your research goal, sample type, what essay you want to run, and then we can really sort of discuss every every single aspect of your experiment, timelines, and obviously costing. Nikki can provide them as well. Uh, so those are, are you know well received because they can be really targeted and specific. Yeah. And there's a, um, Simon, thanks for asking a question. Simon said it seems that the technology is not there for bacterial analysis at the moment. No. Mm. That's Simon. That's sort of the, the one, um, yeah, the sample type that's just really not there. We, we ha I have seen publications, but because we are really limited to this poly A uh, RNA transcripts, I think you just really don't get, you know, much out of these essays, um, to be honest. So I have seen and we have discussed with a, um, a couple of customers to try the Visium platform. Mm. Uh, so you can actually see um, the bacteria in, in a sample, but again, it is totally dependent on what you're, actually, what you're actually asking. So if you're still wanting to capture bacterial transcripts, you will not see them with Visium either. But if you are interested in looking sort of at adjacent um, a gene expression changes in infected tissue, for example, that is something that Visium could answer for you. So while you might not at all, you know, look at anything bacteria related, but you can see they are there, you can stain them, but you can capture the gene expression uh, in the tissue, surrounding tissue. So as a thought, again, I don't know what, what you're exactly after. I also think it's very difficult. I've read some recent papers where I think Sing, any type of single cell RNA sequencing on bacterial cells is, is very, very new. So there's only been one or two, as far as I understand that, I was, haven't done an extensive look, but um, Simon, I can send you um, 
yeah, exactly. Yeah, antibodies, the same thing. But um, yeah, it seems um, technologically quite difficult. But I think the rate of RNA is quite, isn't faster in bacterial cells as well. There's a number of different technical considerations with bacteria that distinguish them from, from eukaryotic cells that makes it hard. But maybe there's other ways uh, with, yeah, yeah, not many people are doing that right now. As I understand. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. I remember when I was approached, I, I did a lot of, you know, asking internally R and D and and looking to, through the literature. I guess the biggest problem for us is if you do capture a bacterial, a bacteria in in one of the droplets, we have sort of lysis reagents. Um, or a lysis protocol that lyses a standard cell, but it won't lyse um, a bacteria appropriately. So you can't even release uh, any transcripts, any RNA from a bacteria in, in our in our platform uh, currently without you know basically breaking into the system, breaking in as in you know changing the conditions, which is really not something that we recommend doing. So your only option is probably uh, Visium at this point um, using antibodies, yeah, to stain certain cell surface proteins to make them visible, but then look at um, expression changes in the surrounding tissue.